Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Let's pray before we dive in. Lord, thank you for uh, the privilege of being able to gather your church, your called out ones, to glorify you and opening your word and reading it and getting a better understanding, some of us even being reminded of, and getting all the more grounded in your truth that's so needed today. Maybe be more discerning after what we learn tonight so that we can truly have the biblical perspective we need to have so that we can be the ambassadors you've called us to be. We give you all the glory for it in Christ's name. Amen. Second Timothy. This is the last letter Paul wrote. Or he was martyred. And he knew it. As you read this book, he knew that his days were numbered and uh, talked about it. So when you think about the Holy Spirit leading the Apostle Paul to write this last letter, he's writing to Timothy, who was a pastor at Ephesus. And you can imagine that he wanted to say a lot. We're just going to look at chapter 3. We're going to look as much of it as we can. Let's just start out. Chapter 3. I'm reading out of a New King James Version where it starts out saying, but know this. Maybe your version says, understand this. I mean, just right. I mean, you just sense the heart of Paul trying to help Timothy understand. But know this that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who crept into the households and make captive, captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. And of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, which, but they will progress no further for their folly will be made manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord, out of them all the Lord delivered me, yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from who you've learned them. And from childhood, you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. we are probably about to stop there. I won't be here through all that. Just to go back to the very first verse, Understand this, know this, that in the last days, well, what is the last days? Well, just simply put, it's the time between Christ's first and second coming, and we're in them. We're in the last days. So in these last days, perilous, it says in the New King James, maybe in your version it says difficult times or times of stress are going to come. He's telling Timothy this. He's a pastor, remember, of Ephesus. He's telling him, know, understand this, Timothy. In these last days that we're in, this has been 2,000 years ago, difficult times are going to come. And then he goes through a list here that we, we read that was incredible. But just to make sure we get an understanding here, I thought I would remind us of Romans 1. Anybody remember that list? It sounded pretty much the same. Romans 1, starting about verse 29, he talks about things that they're going to be doing. And he's talking about, in Romans 1, he's given a description of the ungodly heathen, the pagans, the 
pagan world has been given over to a debased mind filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil blindness. <coughs> they are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who know in the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do they do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So we know in Romans 1, Paul is given a description of just the ungodly. This description we're reading in 2 Timothy is for people proclaiming to be Christians. These are people that are trying to get in the church. These are people that say they're, they profess to know the Lord. Look at this list. Wow. Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow. Well, just a quick go-over. Lovers of themselves. These people are conceited, egotistical. Right? Anybody who calls himself a Christian that falls in that category? Well, they're everywhere. We could, we could share in the 20 years that Alan's been here, we've had some that were maybe here before Alan got here that showed themselves in that flavor. It's all Lovers of money. Greedy for earthly possessions. Boasters or braggarts. Proud, being arrogant. Blasphemers. People who speak evil, have foul mouth, abusive. We've seen a lot of this. We could, I can almost, with my memory, put faces to some of this in church where we've dealt with things like this. A disobedient to parents. Just rebellious, uncontrolled is what that's talked about. Unthankful. Being, meaning that if they're ungrateful, they're, they're lacking in any appreciation. Unholy. Means profane. Irrelevant. Ir irreverent. Holding nothing sacred. Unloving, that would be a hard-hearted person that's unnaturally callous, unforgiving, refusing to make peace or refusing to any type of effort towards reconciliation. Slanderers, these are people who spread false and malicious reports. If you've been in church long, you see some of this sometimes and you wonder what's going on. You know, I've been, I've only been alive 58 years, but I've seen denominations <coughs> Pretty much fold. Or they're ordaining women or, or giving legitimacy to homosexuality. And you think, what's going on? What do we see here? Paul was warning us a long time ago the difficult times are coming. Things like this are going to happen. So when you see stuff, I had somebody, I think it was Shane in here a couple weeks ago, talking about what's going on in the Southern Baptist Convention. What's going on? Well, it's sort of exciting in a way when you look at it from a different view. The Lord is separating things. You really see him who's with him and who isn't. Who's, who's standing on self-pride and arrogant stances or who's standing with Scripture is really becoming very clear. Just like we, we look back now at uh, what we said John Wesley would roll over in his grave to know what was going on in some of the Methodist teaching. Uh, we see now what, what happened. There's been a huge separation. I get to teach one of the ones that that gets to teach the new members class, and a lot of times I'm sort of surprised, but it's exciting. There's some in the new members class that will ask me specific questions about, have you heard about so-and-so? What about this denomination, what they're doing? Did you hear about uh, a certain preacher that's, that, seem, that seems to have gone off the deep end? That's discernment, and you should be that way. We should be, you know, there's actually some books in my library at home that I've had to sort of take off the shelf by somebody put a little note in there, you know, uh, don't follow this guy. You, you got to watch the library, right? Make sure there's some books that you, know, you just you hope everybody finishes strong, but sometimes they don't. Slanderers, again, spreading false and malicious reports. We're in Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three. Uh, without self-control, these people have uncontrolled passions. Brutal. They're savage and unprincipled. Despisers of good, they're utterly opposed to goodness in any form. Traitors, treacherous to traitors, 
Headstrong means reckless, self-willed, and rash. Haughty means conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Which reminds me of a verse in Matthew 6.21. It says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I've heard from our pulpit before, and Satan doesn't want to destroy the church, he'd love to join. This is the way he goes about it. He likes to slide in somebody who holds a false profession of faith and has this type of motives in regards to loving themselves, money, boastful, unforgiving, slanderous, <clears throat> headstrong. We've seen it. And that's why it's so important. That to have like a pulpit that's strong, biblically based, so that when somebody who maybe is in this deception, they're not going to feel comfortable. Somebody, even in the new members class, we trust that one of the reasons why we have that is so that people can clearly see what we believe, what we believe, what, we're, what you're going to hear taught. We have an overview of theology. You, you can go over all that and you get a real understanding of what we hold to and believe and teach. It doesn't mean that, uh, for example, we actually go over the doctrine of sovereign election in, in the members' class. Because you're going to hear it in Sunday school, it's in the Bible. But you don't have to, maybe it's new. You know, you didn't have to understand sovereign election to be a way. It wasn't until years after I got saved, I don't know your testimony, but that you began to see that in Scripture. and study it and it's hard teaching and began to realize it's that everywhere it's all it's, a, it's not something you have to be willing to say you understand that you're willing to say hey I didn't, that's new to me I didn't know that was in there or I'm, I'm not going to cause a ruckus in a Sunday school class because somebody's teaching it or, or not listen to our pastor if he brings it up it's, a, it's the Bible teaches but there are certain things that are heels worth dying on are they not the ones who, as we see in verse 5, after going over this list, he says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. In other words, this form is sort of like a shadow. They have an outward shape or appearance of being a Christian, but their ungodly behavior reveals that they're really living a lie. And he says to turn away from them. Timothy Somebody comes into Ephesus where he was a pastor and they have some of this type of arrogance they don't want to hear. I can remember, here's just one example. There was a man one time who uh, didn't agree with what was going on, with how we were handling church discipline in church. There was a guy that was, uh, his grandmother came to us and told us my grandson, who was 30-something years old, was living with somebody who wasn't his wife. We didn't know anything about it, but she was concerned for him. She's already talked to him. He won't listen. Would you all go talk to him? So we went to go talk to him, and he wouldn't listen. He actually said, I know what you are doing. I know what's written in the Bible, but I, I'm staying with her. She's going to Matter of fact, he said, that's why I joined the church. Yeah, I just got So, I mean, again, don't we, uh, when you understand Second Timothy 3, you sort of see what's going on. Sometimes you're like, I was naive. I'm like, what's up? You know, what's going on here? You know, but when you, before you study scripture, you see that there's always going to be somebody who's trying to lower the bar and bring it down into an unholy. Uh, and you, we have to, we can't plow around that stump. You have to deal with it. If not, then you're going to have problems everywhere. So, but uh, so we did share with him and this older gentleman here at church that we didn't know. We hope that everybody's in line with what we teach. He came to us and was wanting to talk. We need to sit down and talk. About what? And we, yeah, sure, what? Can you give us an idea so we can... It was about that. But dealing with somebody who's living with somebody that's not their wife. He thought that we, would, we shouldn't have been doing that. And we said, well, can, well bring your Bible because we're going to want to open the Bible. And he said, oh, I'm just sort of a rebel. I don't really don't care what the Bible says. I've just got something I want to... You know, that sort of brings us to where we've come... Over the 20 years, is that if you don't, if you got an issue with with what we're doing, leaders in the church, we need to be able to bring our Bibles and, and see what 
be willing to say, well, if it says that here, then we need to agree that's what it says and we need to do it. But to say we're going to close and just have an argument or something, what do you think? We're, we're just wasting time. So we, it always comes back to this. It's the truth. And others in his family went around the back door and told this young man who we were calling to repentance. Uh, they told him that they didn't agree with us or the church. And uh, it really was, it's like giving the person solace in his sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, um, and of course, when those things happen, you know, the, the, the time of those people staying in the church is not going to be very long. Of course, we grieve people to, to leave, but, but, you know, the longer I've been here, Jim and the rest of y'all, it's not so much that they chose to leave this place. It's that God wouldn't allow them to stay with that type of heart and that attitude because he's got a special work we're trying to protect here. And if you stand against Scripture, you stand against God. I mean, we want to be going through James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And to love the world, the Bible says, is to be in enmity with God. That you are literally a spiritual adulterer when you side with the things that are temporal and you <laughs> neglect the things that are eternal. Now, now see, what Jim's talking about, all these things a little different than Romans chapter 1. He's talking about the lost and the, you know, that they don't have, these are the ones that are pretending to be Christians. A form of godliness. And, and that same old boy that said he was a rebel walked me around this church and was pointing out all the things he'd done through the years. And uh, how, what, what would we do without him? You know, if anybody ever says that to me, I, I, I pretty much say, I guess we'll find out one day because none of us are going to live forever. And it's just that type, and, and y'all haven't had to deal with that, thankfully. That's, that was first four or five years. Now, we're waiting for that if it comes back around. And I hope that that, I mean, like Jim says, we can catch a lot of this in the new members class. Unless they have a really big kind of form of godliness, and they're hiding this other stuff. But this other stuff, I'm telling you, and you all know it, it leaks. It, you can't keep garbage in a house. It talks about that. It's going to manifest. Oh, it, just give it time. Right. Just give it time. And, and that's why you see Paul warning Timothy about putting somebody in the leadership too quickly. Mm -hmm. Because what that means is that the leadership is... It's 7 o'clock. Very many words. <laughs> I knew it works. <laughs> so but once you put someone in leadership, what what's happened is you put your stamp of approval on them. And so you really have to be slow uh, and deliberate because we all can fail, but this person has an agenda. Right. Yeah, just to mention another one. We took one through the new members class and uh, some of y'all I'm just reminding you of what you've already done. And that, uh, Put together these little applications you can sort of fill out. And did you read the overview of theology? Did you have any questions, any concerns? Is everything okay? It's not that we expect everybody to be a theologian, but is there, if you had issues with anything, and he said he read it all, and no problems with it, and then about a year or so later we find out that he doesn't believe in hell. And that's in part of our overview of theology and what we believe and teach. I mean, the Bible's goodness. Well, and, well, the other part is he was trying to be meek and gentle, and you know I'll study this, and y'all give me some time, and we said, well, sure, we'll be glad to, to teach you and reteach you. We, I bought several books, we met several times, and then it wasn't long that it manifested. He was telling us that we were arrogant and prideful for not accepting what he believed. Now, and trying to take some other members and get them to thinking what he was thinking. Yeah. And, and, and see, when you, here's the thing. When this happens, know that it's it's not just that one family. It's normally got two or three or four others. And I've talked to, I'll, I'll ask people now, who's with you on this? And I've had people say nobody, and then by the time I got home, my phone's ringing and tell me that they've lied to me, that there are others involved. You see, I mean, it, it, it's it, God sees it all, and it manifests itself. Be sure to know Numbers 23, 32, or 32, 23. That's why we keep our, we keep our sins short. 
forgiveness law and go to the Lord because all of us can go this way if we're not careful. It takes just a little pride that just continues to build and we'll find ourselves on a plank on a ship about ready to jump out into the water if we're not careful. And that's why I'll ask in the new members class or Ben or whoever's teaching it, you know, have you, is this what you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ we're talking about, that He is God, He's the Son of God, and His death, burial, and resurrection? Is that what you're trusting? It's not based upon anything you've ever done or your baptism, your keeping the Ten Commandments, whatever. You know, I was Catholic, you eat fish on Friday, you can add anything to it. Is there? No. It's a totally Christ and Christ alone. He is God and His death, burial, and resurrection. I'll ask you, and you have to yes. Sometimes I hear people say, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, and then some people are like, I'll, I'll have to deal, but that's just me. And, uh, that's what you got to do, but you just never know. So we're trying to be a good keeper of the church, recognizing, first of all, that Christ builds His church. We're just stewards of it. I mean, we're just trying to do the best we can to keep everything in order and but he's he's the he's the ark, he's the chief cornerstone of his church. So they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power and again he tells us to say from such people turn away or avoid. So if somebody uh, comes and wants to just know about our church and starts telling us things that we don't we don't hold to or wants to interject something, then you just have to tell them it's probably better if you can find somewhere else to go. But you can you can see and believe what we're teaching here. We're not we're not moving on the deity of Christ. We're not moving on grace. We're not moving on the resurrection. We're not moving on the we can I mean all those things that fill to Christ did. One thing about the new members class is you'll find that Every, everybody's coming out of something. I came out of Roman Catholicism, but I had some homespun junk of my own, right? Everybody's got sort of a patchwork theology of something. They, not, nobody was born a Christian. And in our country, you can have a little bit of something. You can turn on the TV and get a little something, and you can get something grandma, and you can get something out of some book at the dollar store, and the next thing you know, you think you're a, the Apostle Paul, I guess. I don't know, but it has to be grounded in Scripture. Or you end up like these that have a form of godliness, but their behavior completely proves like the opposite. Then in verses 6 and 7, he says, For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Was that a good example? Or a picture of somebody knocking on your door here like that. You had that? Hi, we're in the neighborhood. We're with the Latter day Saints of Jesus Christ. If you have, maybe I'm the only one that's had that, but I've had them. We've had them here. Come visit. Uh, that's a perfect example. They creep in the households and make. So. We're really sort of seeing a method of false teaching, how they creep in. They might speak about God. They might speak about the Holy Spirit. They might speak about Jesus. The Mormons will give you a Bible. I don't know if you realize it. They'll give you a Bible. Even though they don't believe that's... they got another one on top of that. It takes precedence over that. But they but they don't even uh, believe what the Scriptures teach. They'll find you on Facebook, too. They'll find you on Facebook? Yeah, I got approached by one on Facebook recently. Yeah. And I told her that I didn't believe in the Book of Mormon. And she said, well, have you tried it? And have you read it? Well, let's talk about it. And I'm like, no, thanks. The ones that knocked on my door, they said they're the Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ. And I immediately knew who they were. And I just said, well, I'm, I you know, appreciate you coming by, but you know, I'm a Christian. They said, well, we are too. And I said, no, you're not. I was able to share with them who Jesus Christ is. Because they come across as if they believe what they want to trick you into thinking we believe the same. We had one of our deacons just call me one day and said, That's Mormon, just keep the body. He's up here at the house. He's over here again. Can you come over here? And I just called out and said, What are you doing? We got in the car and just drove over there and, and met the guy. And 
the deacon was just confused because the guy was the Mormon was trying to tell him that they believed the same thing. So we were, we just shared with the Mormon kid what he believed, and he's had to come out saying, "Yeah, that's what I believe." That's the complete opposite of the saved by grace. Matter of fact, it starts, and you can usually completely whether any of these in this list of all these lovers of themselves just go over the deity of Christ. You just go over who Jesus Christ is, and you sometimes have to really work it. Make sure, oh, I believe he's the Son of God. Well, no, no, man, that's good. But is he God in human flesh? Was things created by him, for him? Is he the deity? Is he God? Is he the Son of God? Is he what he did on the cross when you recognize he's God in human flesh? The, the fact that he died and took our place, he was a substitutional, he's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of that completely obliterates thinking there's anything that I could do to fix this problem, right? There's nothing that good works, joining church, giving money, no, 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 none of that can even, it's not even worth bringing up because if you understand the deity of Christ, there is nothing that we could do. It took him going through that to fix the problem and I had to have the audacity to say somehow that I got to do something, but then you don't understand who Jesus Christ is. You don't understand who he is, then there's nothing that you bring to the cross except your sin. And we had a couple come to church think, through the years, several times. And this last time, I knew that they were back there, so I, I made sure that as we went through the closing of whatever message it was, that I covered the gospel and how clear it was Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, from the Lord of God alone. I went through all of that, and then we. I came out of the pulpit, and several of us were standing around. Those kids were still, they were probably 25 years old, doing a missionary deal. And that one, remember the one kid came up to me and said, Pastor, what a great sermon. Remember he said that? Yeah. And I said, well, son, you don't believe anything I just said. Oh, yeah, I do. And remember, we took him through every point about who Jesus was, and, and, and he had to admit at the very end, he didn't hold to any of that. And then I said, so what you said to me five minutes ago was not the truth. How could you say that? That's the way they're trained. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is, though, when they go on a missionary journey, they got family supporting them and the big church is supporting them. And if they ever leave that, they're out. They're excommunicated. And we told those two boys, I said, I'll tell you what. I know what we called him to Christ. So if you gave your life to Christ right now, I know you'd have nothing except us and the Lord. I said, we'll clear out my office tonight. We'll put two beds in there. There's a shower. We'll find you a job. <coughs> we'll, we'll invest in you because your family's going to absolve themselves from you. You're not going to have a church to go back to, but we'll stand with you. I mean, we were really just answering. Every, we, we, we were... We were dealing with rich young rulers is what we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And like I said Sunday, you know, when he said, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and he said, come follow me. See, they said that they, he said he kept all the Ten Commandments, but the Lord went to the greatest commandment, which is to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he put the big one on him, which all the other ten follow, follow, come from, and what did the young man do? What did we saw him? Just like those two kids. And the whole, everything that God could offer them was offered, and they walked out of here on it. So you talk about a spiritual reckoning and an appointment by God, and if they, and, and we believe that God plants, and His Word doesn't return empty or void, but when it says it doesn't return empty or void, that means either it will be used for further grace, or it's going to be used for what? Wrath to come. It's going to do one or the other. That's why you hear me sometimes say, if you turn away from this, hell just what? It got hotter. That's exactly right. So they creep in. They'll creep into households. Speaking about God, speaking about the Bible, Jesus, even though they don't even believe what the Scriptures teach. It even says they make captives of gullible women. That's another satanic little boy. And then you remember how he, in the Garden of Eden, who did he go to first? Eve. My best friend was raised Jehovah's Witness. And I lived next door to a kingdom hall up in Michigan. And I was kind of used as a training house. And that was the kingdom hall that she used to go to. 
And she told me all their stuff. She told me the way they train people to do it and how they manipulate. And the first thing they want is a woman who's home while her husband's at work. Well, there you go. They want that. And they always go out in pairs. And there's always a trainee and then there's an expert. And she told me how to spot the trainee and don't talk to the expert, just talk to the trainee. But she told me all this stuff and it's highly manipulative. And they are looking for women who are there without their husbands. This speaks of gullible women talking about spiritually weak, but not really grounded women. Like actually says loaded down with sins. They have they have guilt over past sins. Mm -hmm. You can and then it says led away by various lusts, which which means they, there's wrong living. Can, can actually lean towards or embrace wrong doctrine. If you're living wrong and somebody walks up and starts telling, knocks at your door and starts teaching you some false doctrine, then you're just real easy prey to listen to it. Mm -hmm. But I work for the Postal Service. I'm going to tell you, you can't imagine how many pieces of mail go to people's homes at like the first of the month. Trying to get, they know that's when you're getting your check, or whoever might be getting. They know who's getting a check. I don't know how they know all that, but it's amazing the stuff they'll send right about the time you're getting your check. They're saying, "Hey, you need to make your offering to this or whatever. You want your earn your way to heaven. You need to give the plant a seed towards whatever." I mean, it's just sad. Which verse seven says they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know. Simply stated, you know, ignorance of Scripture and sinful living makes one utterly undiscerning and defenseless against unbiblical and ungodly methods. So maybe you went in the, we've gone into people's house before and was sort of amazed at some of their library. Really, the world, you know, books that you would think you know, I, would, I would never have in my house that are false teachers and that again, they're always learning from false teachers, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they're not in it. They're being deceived. Paul is telling Timothy, difficult times are coming. Understand this. It's resurrected three times. You see that? I'm sorry. Can you? Can you? Yes. He keeps coming over here. Right. So always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then he gives examples. He says, I probably pronounced this in this word, Janus and Jambres resist, resisted Moses. You think, who is that? And you know, you can't find those names in Scripture, but they were well known of. Somebody has done some study, I've studied some commentaries, and they were led to believe that maybe he was a, these two were the evil imposters in Exodus 7. Exodus 7, remember what's going on? The Lord instructed Moses with his staff to just drop it down and it turned into a snake. Do you remember that? Do you remember what also happened? The some imposters came. Yeah. Some evil imposters came and they did the same thing. It's just, that's what he's comparing them to. These evil imposters. But also, as Timothy's writing this, or Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, he reminds him of a couple more in the same book. 2 Timothy chapter 1, you got Philegius and Hermogenes. They turned away from Paul and deserted him. He's reminding Timothy of this stuff. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 17, it says, Hymenaeus and Pilatus, they strayed concerning the truth, and they were teaching falsely about uh, the believer's bodily resurrection. He's just bringing people up. Be ready, Timothy. Typical times are coming. And he says uh, in verses 8 and 9, they resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be made manifest to all, as theirs also was. Resisting the truth, these people are opposing the truth. Men of corrupt mind or depraved minds they disapproved concerning the faith means they were rejected. They claimed to be Christians, but were not. And they're going to progress no further for the folly to be made of manifest, as theirs also was. Sometimes I wonder when. It would be nice if some of this was revealed. I can remember it's probably been 30 years ago. 
Fellowship of Athletes years ago made a mistake. They, they give the responsibility to some coaches in one of, the, one of the counties here close by, maybe Williamson County, somewhere over there, to give an award to their best Fellowship of Christian Athlete student athlete. And they gave it to one. And come to find out after they gave it to him, they didn't talk to him, find anything out. The kid was a Mormon. <laughs> Fellowship of Christian Athletes, given the great Fellowship of Christian Athletes reward to the Mormon, well, they had the audacity to pull the nerve to really pull it back, say, oh, we didn't know you were a Mormon, you can't, and it made the paper. Which was really a good thing. Uh, but it shouldn't have been handled that way, but even in handling things wrong, the Lord exposed Mormonism. A lot of people thought that somehow they believed the same Jesus we believe in. And it was exposed, and people could actually talk about it. We talked about it in the church. Youth were asking questions, and the church was asking questions, and we were able to share the difference. Between, so even in the midst of that, we were able to show that they resisted the truth. They were corrupt and disapproved. They claimed to be Christians, but were not. And it was manifest. So, Timothy is being reminded again by Paul at verse 10, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. What a heart of Paul here is concerned with Timothy. Again, we're just looking at chapter 3 here. You read the whole book. But he wants to make sure you've carefully followed my doctrine. Paul's doctrine was basically teaching everything truthfully regarding the Word of God. He also says he followed my manner of life. His conduct consistent with, with with the message he preached. He lived what he believed. He lived what he taught. Purpose. His purpose was to separate from moral and doctrinal evil. His faith. Followed his faith. His trust in the Lord. His long-suffering. His attitude towards persecutors and critics. His love, Paul's love was selflessly, selflessly devoted to the Lord. His perseverance, his fortitude and endurance. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where Paul talks about following me as I follow the Lord. Paul was loyal to the Word of God and to the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling him, carefully follow this. That's just verse 10. Verse 11 and 12, he said, talks about persecutions and afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. Timothy was from the Lystria area, and he was, I'm sure, well aware of what happened to Paul in these cities. Just for our reminder, in Acts 13.50, you see him in Antioch, where he's referring to Paul and Barnabas were actually expelled from the region for preaching truth. In Iconian, in Acts 14, verses 3-6, through six, they had a violent attempt to abuse and stone Paul. <laughs> I mean, when you experience a little persecution for standing with Christ, how do you respond? You respond with a peace and knowing that if the Lord was standing here saying what I'm saying, that he would be go he's going through it, I'm going through it, and I have a peace that I'm standing with the Lord. If he was here, he'd be doing what I do. Or are you naive like I used to be and get a little bit of like, who do you think you are? Get offended with somebody with you know, should be more scripturally biblically grounded so that when you see things that happen, if you're standing with truth, like the truth we mentioned earlier, the deity of Christ, the, the gospel, if somebody gets mad, which that's going to happen, you're going to see that here. They attempted to stone Paul. And at Lystra, Acts 14, 19, Paul was stoned. Not only was he stoned, but they drug him out of the city. They thought he was like near death. talks about these persecutions in verse 11. It says, and I endured. 
He endured it. And, and out of them, out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Make sure we understand what he's saying. That he didn't pull him out of it. He delivered him through it. Does that make sense? So when you're going through it, you're going to have... Remember when Stephen was being stoned to death, he looked up and what did he see? The Lord was standing there. So he he didn't take him out of the stoning, but he saw him and delivered him through it. Remember that? That's what happens when you're being persecuted for Christ. In verse 12, what a wonderful verse. Yes, Paul telling Timothy all these different people that are opposing the difficult times and people are going to try to enter the church and have all these forms of godliness but deny the power. Yes, Timothy, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not just me, Timothy. Not just me, Timothy. You, Timothy. Not just you, Timothy, but anybody. You know, when I first read that, I'm thinking, wait a minute. All who desire to live godly? Does that mean that's an option for us or something? No. Everybody who's desiring to live godly in Christ Jesus has been redeemed. Anybody who's been redeemed from their sin and recognizes that they were headed to hell and now they're not, they're following Him. They want to live for Him. They're, they love Him. They, it's their desire to fulfill whatever He'd want them to do. I want to, want to glorify you in my work, at my job, with my family, with wherever, and that's living a godly life. So all who desire to live a godly life are Christians. It's not optional. Everyone who's a Christian is going to tr strive to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, and when you do, you're going to suffer persecution. A godly life will expose wickedness of others. Instead of repenting of their sins and turning to Christ, they will seek to destroy the one who has shown them up for what they really are. Is that what Christ experienced? Is that what Paul experienced? And why should we be any different? So, back to, if you're not careful, we can get some of these other things on us. Uh, love of ourselves. These people held to that, lost people. But if you're not careful, why haven't you or why haven't I shared the gospel with Uncle Joe? He might get mad at me or he might not he might give me a Christmas present or he might not. Why would I think that's because I love me? I'm more concerned with me than Uncle Joe. If you really loved Uncle Joe, you're praying for him already. And you're looking for an opportunity to share with him the gospel. Right? If you're not, then you love you more than Uncle Joe. Does that make sense? We've got to be careful. Making sure that we're doing everything we can. Starts at home first. We all have, I would imagine, I'm not the only one that has people in our family that don't know the Lord. I would imagine we all. And so when you sit down, here it comes, Thanksgiving dinner, going to be here for a while, and maybe they'll look at you, hey, you want to leave the prayer? Sure. It's going to be the gospel. Sure, I love the fact that everybody brought up some food, but I'm more concerned that Uncle Joe and the ones here maybe that I never get to see again, maybe somebody might die before the years up. A lot of people have. Sure, the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the food, but family, and but most of all, thank you for Christ, sending Jesus Christ to die so that we can be forgiven of all of our sin. Thank you for granting us repentance, be able to turn from sin and trust in the finished work of Christ. Say that in the prayer. And praying for Uncle Joe or whoever, and maybe somebody will call you or pull you aside while you're eating and want to talk more about it. Pray for it. But always remember, sometimes, instead of repenting of sins and turning to Christ, they're going to not be happy with you. You might not get invited next Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner, right? You just never know. So, just so we understand there's no illusions of the world getting better, he actually says, verse 13, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Wow. It doesn't seem possible. How could they get worse? Well, I just think about it. Well, let's think about it. Just step back for a minute. I mean, when, when God gives people over to a debased mind, we're starting to really see that now. We're, we're having governments making decisions on whether or not men can go in a woman's bathroom. That's debased. That's that's gone. They're, not, they're gone. They've been given over. Something's not clicking. For people to, I'm just looking at Eddie holding this beautiful little baby a while ago. We're talking about that face. It's so, it ought to be on, a, on, on the Gerber baby bottle. Just a 
Thomas is his name. And there's people that are cheering abortion. Even after the baby's born, you can make a decision whether or not you want it or not. It's, that would fall under brutal, maybe, you think? Golly. But I wrap this over in uh, Deuteronomy 28. I have to reprobate mine. I turn them over. It's a Romans 1. The truth from the lie. Romans 1. The first place I think of was where he gives them over to the base reprobate thinking. That's Romans 1. That's where I'm thinking. I have to look up Deuteronomy and see what happens. For sure, Romans 1. I just read that today and I saw that. So that's where he gives them over. Remember the sexual passions and women just get to so they forget their real role of being a woman and a mother and they start having desires for each other and he just says and gives them over. Well, in Isaiah 520, woe unto them who call good evil and evil good, bitter sweet, sweet bitter. It's just flipped. And we shouldn't be surprised and we don't need to sit there and go, Try to figure it out. It's just what the Bible says. We need to be ready for it. So I'm terrified to how bad it's going to get. We can actually think we have passed the where people, the Roman people, can are ashamed of us. <laughs> you know what they were going through was, is, wasn't as bad as what we're seeing today. But again, he tells us this in these last days. Recognize this is going to go on. So you're looking for the return of Christ? When does he come? Well, this is a great pointing towards that. You can sort of see that the world has, God has given them over. And there's a huge separation going on. I can't, you know, the Bible talks about few there be. And many are on the wide path and there's only a few on the narrow. And I'm telling you, the more I grow and more I live here, the fewer it seems to get. And what's going on is that separation. So when Christ pulls the church out of here in the rapture, nobody's going to be standing around thinking, Wow, where'd he go? Everybody's going to know, I'm glad he's out there. All these people are going to say, I'm glad he's out of here. He was keeping me from doing what I want to do with a guilt-free conscience. And all he did was look at me when I was doing something I ought not be doing. It made me feel bad. I want him out of here. Which is really the most loving thing you can do, right? The world says for me to go to somebody and tell them that what you're doing is sin, you need to repent. They say that's unloving. They say that's hate speech. But true love is going to someone and telling them, son, what are you doing? These kids, I hear school teachers talking about kids in school, they talk about transgender junk. And Sit down with them and tell them. So that's, that, that's an offense to God. That's sinful activity. And God is not pleased with that type of thinking. You need to guard your mind and hide God's word in your heart so you won't be in any way entertained by that fleshly, worldly garbage of sinful stuff. But the world would say, that would be hate speech to talk to your kid like that. If you're not talking to them, they are. That's what I'm getting at. You better be raising them in Christ and in the Bible. And don't think God's not... Don't think God's overlooking you. It's just His wrath is to come. And it's just building wrath upon wrath upon wrath. I know we want it to be over now. I, mean, I know we want to have the vindication now. We want the gavel to get today. Come Lord Jesus. But, but his timing is perfect. Mm -hmm. And so when it does come, we'll be a witness to it. We'll be able to see the reckoning of the Lord. And so just in his mindset, the Lord, we get out and live a Christian life. We, we do what is right. We trust the Lord. Uh, he, you know, we're invincible. We're, we're not going to be killed or we're not going to be, we're not going to die until the Lord is ready for us to come home. We're destined for a man to die. That's just so that, that date is already out there, so we don't have to worry about that. We get out, we love the Lord, we love our family, we love our church, we love our neighbor, we do what God's Word says, we don't get distracted by all this stuff, and let God have His way. And He will. He's going to. Vincent's his mind, saith the Lord. It may not be next year, this year, it may be a hundred years from now, but it's coming. I don't have to be the police for the world. I don't have to make everything perfect. God's going to do that one day. All I have to do is the great, the great command, the great commission, and love as He loved, and, and major on those things. Seek His kingdom first and His righteousness, and He'll take care of all the rest. Don't get distracted by trying to fix what we can't fix. The gospel is what fixes it. Not the social gospel. 
not mm -hmm. trying to give things away to make people like you so they're like Jesus. It's not that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God and the salvation to all who believe. Keep it the simple, the main thing, and then enjoy your life that God's given. That is, that's the abundant life is doing God's will. And He will get you through, just like Paul said. He got him through it. Right. He's finished, he finished everything he had called him to do. Didn't he was ready anything to go. better. He was getting worse and worse. But he accomplished everything the Lord had him to do. It's, Paul wasn't results oriented. He was more concerned with pleasing the Lord and what he did. He left the results with God. This leads us just to verse 14 here. Verse 14 and 15. Let's see if we can get that in maybe here. But you, and he's talking, here's Paul to Timothy. You, Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. <laughs> he's learning. Think about these letters and the times he spent with the Apostle Paul. Knowing from whom you've learned them, and from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Continue in these things. Continue to grow roots in Scripture so that you can be discerning. Like the ones going through the new members class here lately, asking specific questions of discernment in regards to what do we believe? What do we hope? We're here in the Southern Baptist Convention are going woke and they're doing all this. What do y'all hold? You know, they're asking these types of questions. Good stuff. That's what we need to be. And we should be grounded in Scripture so that we are, are not in any way Confusing, it ought to be crystal clear what we hold to and what we believe. Continually steadfast in the Word of God. Hopefully, that was encouraging in regards to you see, sometimes maybe you wonder what is going on, the craziness in this world. Well, we see in Scripture, we were told by that. Timothy, Paul told him, to understand this, know this, that in the last days difficult times are coming and you're seeing. Praise the Lord. The Lord's in control. He's got us here for a reason. To shine for Him. Look for opportunities to share the gospel with people. Praying for Him first. You at least ought to be praying for Uncle Joe, right? You got somebody in your family that don't know the Lord, you're praying for Him, right? Now you're looking for the opportunity. Just hoping maybe He'll call or you'll see Him at dinner and you can talk to Him, ask Him a question to see if maybe. The Lord will open the door where you can share with That's why we're here. Let's get some prayer and we'll uh, go to prayer time. Lord, thank you for your word this, this evening. As uh, the world continues to get darker and darker, we, Lord, we know that we are light in you and that we should be brighter and brighter. People should see all the more who we believe and who we stand for, and it should be evident in the way we live. The world lives completely out of control, unprincipled lives, just craziness, but we should be Christ-like. People should see control, love, peace, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives so that it points all to you, gives you the glory, and, and doors can open where we can share. But if not, if we're persecuted for standing with you, may we rejoice in that as you tell us to, thanking you for being able to be clearly seen you are in us. Lord, thank you for our time tonight. May you glorify also in our prayer time tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.